So I want to talk a little bit about Bonhoeffer, Bonifer, however we uh, <laughs> pronounce it. Well, you know, there's a funny story about this because the Germans, of course, will say Bonhoeffer, mm-hmm. right? which when you say it as an American, it just sounds corny. Yeah. But uh, Americans usually say Bonhoeffer or Bonifer. But if you're a British scholar, you sort of go back and forth. Okay. So you say the German or the American. But I just call them DB. Okay. So just simplify things. We'll call them DB. Tell maybe a little bit about the series. How did it start? What's sure. the big idea behind it? Why is the series needed? I think you could ask yourself, why do we have the series? Because you have a lot of books on Warfield. You have mm-hmm. books on Schaefer. You have books on Bonifer. So you have biographies. You have studies of their thought. I think as we put the series together, what we were specifically aiming for was what do these folks have to say about living the Christian life? Um, I think we can... Um, almost get into a a mode where we only have what's on our contemporary horizon to think about the Christian life. Mm -hmm. So we have a model, and it's maybe it's a good model, but we think, well, that's how you live the Christian life. What's interesting, as you look through church history, you begin to see that different thinkers approach the Christian life differently. They had different emphases. uh, They had different... um, starting points or perhaps different central points. So one of the things I hope the series does is is show folks that uh, there's there's not a a one-size-fits-all for the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. There's different dispositions, there's there's different approaches. But the other thing I think is these are all people that we look up to, we appreciate them, we appreciate what God did through them. But rather than looking at their ideas, we're actually looking at how they approach the Christian life and how they live the Christian life. And I think that can just help us in our own discipleship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so we're, we're not doing biographies, although there's plenty of biographical material in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not doing theological studies, although there's that as well. We're asking the question, how did they approach the Christian life and how did they live the Christian life? And then the question that uh, we keep driving uh, the writers towards is, how can we bring that forward mm-hmm. to today and to my life? So I, as a reader, how can I, what's the takeaway for me and, and my own living of the Christian mm-hmm. life? So really a marrying together of uh, biography, theology, and then uh, practicality, spirituality, right. application. Yes. So for you, I know you've done a lot of work on um, Luther, a lot of work on Machen mm-hmm. um, and Jonathan Edwards. What drew you in particular to Bonifer? There's a few people that I read that no matter where I read in them, I never come away thinking, oh, I just wasted my time. Mm-hmm. And uh, Edwards is certainly that. Luther is that for me. Augustine is that for me. And uh, Bonifer is that. Uh, I always feel like any time I spend with him is time well spent. Uh, I'm always feeling challenged. Uh, when I come away from reading him. How, how frustrating is it for you as a scholar and as a Christian who wants to benefit from his work that mm. in uh, distinction from the other guys that you mentioned, like Edwards and like uh, Augustine, we really didn't get to see the full fruit of his mm. work. I mean, he didn't live long enough to you know write his magnum opus, and, or maybe he did. Um, but how difficult is that as one approaching and trying to apply what he wrote, given he was a man writing on the run and uh, yes. yeah. and his life was cut short? Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, he's, he's 39 years old So when he, when he dies. Uh, so you, you think about this. It's in the 40s, 50s, 60s is when people are finally coming into their, the fullness of their ideas and expressing those. So here's a guy, 39 years old. There is a fragmentary nature to a number of Bonifer's writings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that's because, of course, not only is this 39 years old, but also because, as you say, he's on the run, uh, and not just his imprisonment. Still, within those 39 years, he's able to produce in what's been put into the collected writings of Bonifer 16 volumes. It's not just letters and papers, and there's a number of that, but life together. And anybody writing on community these days, and there's a lot of people writing on community these days, they're always going back to the source and Bonfer's life together. And then, of course, you have cost of discipleship, which for so many has helped them to think seriously about what Christ's demands are on our lives. Um, for the more philosophically inclined, there's his early dissertations 
Uh, there's also his book on ethics, which is a very rewarding but a very challenging read. One of the controversies or uh, mm-hmm. you know points of discussion in the last few years uh, since Metaxas' biography came out was the degree to which evangelicals might try to uh, create their historical heroes in their own image. And uh, so maybe just to ask you, without you know, maybe bypassing that discussion of Metaxas's bio per se, um, was Bonifer an evangelical? Yeah, I think that's a very important question. And I think it's an important question because if we're talking about his views on the Christian life, we need to see him, we need to see if his theology is orthodox. And so, um, you know, there's this, all this discussion today about orthopraxy and does it privilege orthodoxy? But as I try to look at things, and I think a scripture would have us uh, see it, orthopraxy flows from orthodoxy. So this question of Bonifer's theological commitment, to me, is a very crucial question. So we look at this and we say, well, what, where can we put him on a camp, right? Mm. And we've got to look at a couple of things. Is he orthodox in his view of Christ and in his view of the Trinity? And he is. Uh, he, he did uh, lecture significantly on Christology at Berlin, and those were published as Christ the Center, which were largely drawn from student notes. But in Christ the Center, he is right there as a Nicene, Chalcedonian, Orthodox Christology from the early creeds. Orthodox view of the Trinity. So we've got that. We can check that box mm-hmm. off. Right. Then the next thing, especially for evangelicals, is scripture and justification. Uh, salvation issues. A fascinating fact in the, not a lot of folks don't pay as much attention to this one. It's in the latest volume of Bonifers that's translated into English from the German, where he has his lectures on justification, mm-hmm. and he he is uh, making the case in there that uh, when you talk about Christology, you have to make a necessary step to justification, and it's this classic link of the person of Christ to the work of Christ. And he goes on to say that the doctrine of justification is absolutely essential to the work of Christ, which then is absolutely essential to a Christology. Mm-hmm. He even speaks in terms of his own for conversion. Uh, he has uh, some references this uh, to, uh, to this in one of his letters to his brother of how um, his experience in New York, uh, not at Union <laughs> Theological Seminary, but his experience at the at the Abyssinian Baptist Church, the Black Church in Harlem, of writing about how for the first time he's reading God's Word as if it were God's Word. Mm. Um, and, and he frames it in language that evangelicals recognize as conversion language. So he's got a solid view of justification and also has a sense of conversionism. You know, you're not just born into this thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a, a, a justification event in mm-hmm. your life. But the real piece is scripture. That's the one, you know, what's, what's his view of scripture? If we back up to a really fascinating time in 1933, uh, this is the, the national church, the German Lutheran church has endorsed the Nazi party. And it comes to be called from then on the Reich Kirche, right? The, the Reich Church, um, a group, of course, saw that as a total misstep, forms the Confessing Church. And uh, DB gets tasked with writing up a statement for this Confessing Church. He's at Bethel, and uh, at Bethel is this place where there was a hospital and an orphanage and also a seminary. <laughs> so it's an interesting mix. Uh, Bonifer would say there would be folks wheeled in on their hospital beds and there would be vagabonds from off the street and seminary students, and they'd all sit together. And it's just always funny to me how he puts in seminary students, you know, right in there. But uh, there he is at Bethel, uh, and he's working on this Bethel statement. Now the Bethel statement is going to get revised by a committee and then it's going to get dumped all together in favor of the Barman Declaration. Mm -hmm. And many people are familiar with the Barman Declaration. Karl Barth was a significant writer of it. And that comes to be the statement of the Confessing Church. But behind the Barman is this Bethel Confession. And in the first one that Bonifer wrote, he makes a statement that scripture is uh, fully valid is the language he uses. The scripture is fully valid. Uh, that's a pretty close statement to using the word inerrancy, mm-hmm. which is the word we want to see somebody saying for a high view of authority 
uh, we as evangelicals. Once it becomes the work of a committee, that statement on Scripture becomes that Scripture is a uh, valid witness to itself, that it has mm -hmm. coherence within itself. Now that's a good thing, uh, to be self-referentially coherent is a good thing, philosophers like that. But as a view of scripture, that's far different from a declaration that is fully valid. Mm. Now uh, uh, if you want to get the full story on it, you have to buy the book and mm -hmm. get the full story. But just to give you enough there to see that this is a high view of scripture. Now what happens is when Bonhoeffer sees the committee's, what the committee did to his statement, he writes a scathing review of it and he signs it anonymous and then after the anonymous he puts in parentheses db <laughs> so so he was sort of re giving up the the anonymous and it's also why we can call him db because he, mm. but he's so frustrated with this turn of events that he goes to london and pastors two german congregations in london for several months in 33 34 and it shows me a number of things it shows me that that Bonifer was concerned about making a statement for social justice and the confessing church was going to do that. But it also shows me that for Bonifer, for this confessing church to work, it had to be grounded theologically. And when he saw what was happening with such a dis no, no, crucial foundational statement of scripture, uh, he's frustrated and he jumps ship. Hmm. So as I look at that, uh, I see a lot there that, that that justifies and vindicates moving Bonifer to the side of theological conservatives. Now some want to argue that, that uh, some make him out to be an American evangelical, and that might be a stretch because he's a, he's a good German Lutheran, mm -hmm. so, so he may not be a, a great American evangelical. But I have no problem with seeing Bonifer as a theological conservative. And then his orthopraxy flows out of these theological commitments. Mm -hmm. For folks who have read Metaxas's bio, mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, probably for a lot of people, that was the first introduction, a full introduction to right. Bonifer. Um, if they've done that, they have a pretty good sense of his life, his storyline. Mm -hmm. Why would they need a book like this? I mean, what, right. what's, the, what's the need for this sort of book in particular? Right. Uh, that's a great question. And I, I think, uh, well, for one thing, just to say, it's remarkable to me how many people have read Metaxas. Mm -hmm. I bump into them everywhere in my church. Metaxas copies were floating all around. So I just think it's great that there's such an interest in, in Bonifer. Uh, and Metaxas is largely responsible for that among this, in our day, uh, in our moment among evangelicals. I think what's different in my book is number one, the focus on the Christian life. And number two, uh, as a theologian, I'm coming at, and as a church historian, I'm coming at Bonifer very much interested and interpreting him theologically mm. and engaging with him theologically. So there are some elements of biography because Bonifer's life is so much woven into his thought and so much of his modeling of the Christian life is just his life. So there's plenty of biography in there. But I'm also interested in a different set of questions than what Metaxas was interested in and precisely trying to get at uh, what is it for Bonifer that what is the Christian life all about mm -hmm. for Bonifer? And uh, how did he view prayer? How did he view Bible reading? How did he view theological confession and the role of theology in our lives? Uh, how did he view even the idea of sacrifice? And what does love for one another mean? You know, and, and Bonifer, he, he liked to speak of the extraordinary, you know. Um, and he gets that from Jesus saying, you know, if, if, you, if you love your neighbor, that's no big deal. Uh, that's sort of a civic thing. But if you love your enemy, see, that is even more. That's the extraordinary. And so Bonifer spends a lot of time talking about what is, what is a life of love that lives up to what Jesus calls upon us in the Gospels. So I'm looking at those things as sort of my organizing rubric or mm -hmm. the paradigm at which I'm getting at Bonifer. Well, as one who had the chance to read it and edit it, um, you know, I personally benefited from it and was convicted by it and uh, really have hope that a lot of people will, will see this as a, a very good next step after Metaxas to, to go deeper and to see uh, really what made Bonifer tick and what he can say to us today. 
So thanks, Steve, for writing the book and for uh, co-editing the series together. You're quite welcome. Thank you.